uh, another Achievers Tech Talk. This is actually our 11th talk. Uh, really excited to be uh, hosting this one today. We have uh, Natasha Leila here, who is the VP of Engineering at Oenda. Uh, how many of you guys have heard of Oenda before? Good, it's quite a few of you. Uh, really great Toronto tech success story founded in 1996. And from my current discussion that I just had with Natasha, we're sitting around 200 to 300 employees. Um, an amazing story, which I'm sure she's going to touch on. Um, and a topic uh, which is great to be discussing in this day and age, diversity in tech. Uh, something that I know that we're thinking about in Achievers quite a bit as we're expanding globally. But before we get started, just wanted to take care of a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, so the meetup, meetup group is continuing to grow. We're sitting currently at around 967 uh, members. Really excited about that. So close to 1,000. So if you could share that with your friends and help us cross that threshold, that would be amazing. Uh, as always, all the slides and videos are always posted on our meetup group. Um, or on achievers.com slash tech where all the videos will be hosted. So if uh, you want to watch the talk again or if you know somebody that couldn't join us tonight and uh, would benefit by seeing this talk, you can flip over uh, the link to them. So uh, I know you're not here to see me. You're here to see Natasha. So without further ado, Natasha Leila. Thank you. Cheers. Uh, okay, actually, before I get started, uh, just want to thank Achievers for hosting me here tonight. Uh, it's a really cool thing that they do in the Toronto community where all of us technical folks can get together to uh, share ideas and experiences. So I hope that my experiences tonight will be useful to you in, in some way. Uh, before I actually start the talk, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about why I chose this topic. So as uh, Zach mentioned, I'm the Vice President of Engineering at OANDA. Uh, we, are a, we provide a global product uh, across the world. It's an online currency trading platform. Uh, and what currency trading is, is if you are familiar with stocks and equities and trading stocks and equities, it's kind of the same thing except you're trading and investing in currencies, so the Canadian dollar and the US dollar and, and euros. And the real difference between the currency market and the equity markets, if you added all of the equity markets together in one day, the trading volume would be less than the daily trading volume of the currency market. So it's $4 trillion a day. It's a huge, huge, huge market. Uh, and that makes for some interesting and exciting technology uh, projects, that's for sure. So what, what I've found over my career, and certainly at Oanda, is that technology is more and more global, and diversity becomes a very, very important topic. Now, as a woman in a senior technical role, it's probably not all that surprising that diversity is a topic that is you know, near and dear to my heart. Um, but I wanted to kind of show the value of it uh, for, that I hope you can use, either in your businesses or for yourself uh, currently in your career. So before actually, so what I'm going to do, my approach was actually, uh, it's not a bunch of statistics and, and research. I'm actually going to take a case study uh, based on an experience I had a, a few years ago at Oanda when it was a real deployment that, uh, that we went through. And there were many, many challenges uh, involved in this uh, deployment, but ultimately, you know, very, very successful. Uh, before I start, uh, just a show of hands, how many people have actually worked with remote teams, remote technical teams before? Okay, you'll spot all the lies in this presentation then, good. <laughs> so, without further ado, uh, actually before I even get to the case study, this isn't, the case study is not the great French wine blight, but I wanted to tell you a little bit of a story first. So, what is the great French wine blight? So, this is why diversity matters. This is my, my premise to you. Uh, in the 1850s, in the late 1850s, what happened was uh, this, this is an aphid depicted here, by the way, sipping on French champagne. Uh, it's a cartoon from uh, about 1890. And what happened was there were insects called aphids in the United States that came over to France uh, via ships. And they proceeded to devastate about 40% of the grapevines in Europe. And they had no solution for this. So the, the actual issue was, why didn't it happen before that? Well, there was this thing that was invented called the steam engine. And the steam engine made transatlantic crossing faster. Uh, and the increase in the speed of the trip allowed these insects to survive the crossing, interact with these plants that could not deal with these insects, and it proceeded to start just destroying the crop. And it was a big deal in Europe because it was a huge part of their economy. So they started to get very nervous about this. They wanted to solve this problem, obviously. And the first thing they tried were a bunch of chemicals and, and pesticides. And that actually solved their problem, kind of, but the problem was the insects would actually develop a resistance, and then you have to have stronger and stronger chemicals, and eventually your solution is actually killing both the plants and, you know, and the insects as well. So you had to throw that one out the window. The next thing they tried, they started to get a little bit more desperate as time went on. This happened for over like 15 years. 
they decided they were going to try to get a bunch of toads. They were going to put these toads under the grapevines and hope that the toads would eat the aphids. That also didn't work. I don't know how they thought the toads were going to stay under the grapevines. That didn't quite work out the way they planned. So now it's getting even more desperate. The economy is going to hell. The crop is you know, dying. And you know, Americans are winning the wine war, which is just bad for everybody. So what they, what they started to do is the farmers decided that they would take their chickens, and they would take their chickens into the vineyards and hope that the chickens running around would now eat these insects. And not surprisingly, that didn't work either. So you know, time progresses. Uh, the French government actually gave a huge, was giving a huge reward to the people who could solve this problem. And the solution came from two French scientists who, who noticed, rightly so, that the American plants actually didn't have this problem. They were actually quite resistant to the American insects. But they didn't want to just uproot the whole plant and bring it to France because they felt the, the French vines actually had qualities of wine that they wanted to, to preserve. So what they did was they took the roots of the American plant, they took the stem of the French plant, and they grafted the two together. And actually, those are still the basis of the plants in the vineyards today. So this hybrid plant was actually very resistant to these aphids. So what is the moral of the story? Why am I telling you this? Well, <laughs> if you look at it, it was a piece of technology that actually made this contact inevitable. The European wine growers were not going over to America looking to graft plants together to make different kinds of grapevines. I mean, it, it fell upon them and they had to deal with it. My other premise is that it was actually an inability to handle diversity that created you know, the very real threat of losing their crops. Right? Uh, the solution was not chemicals and toads and chickens. Uh, the solution was actually a hybrid plant, and it required pretty much plants from both nations, right? Uh, and finally, I think we can all agree, um, the, the claim was that the the actual diversity in the, in the crop created a, a much better wine. So that's a little bit more subjective, but it's a good goal to have. So you can see, if you kind of run through the story, diversity was actually, originally it was actually the problem. It was really the cause for all the trouble in the beginning, if you recall. And it ended up being the solution. Now the case study that I'm going to take you through is actually, it was, it was more about how do you create value in a more uh, positive way. But you can see here clearly it needed to be a defensive strategy. So on with the actual case study. So what I want to tell you about tonight is what we were trying to do was create, take our trading platform, the Oanda trading platform, so we actually run this business. We own the back end uh, transaction engine, the risk management, the pricing and execution, and we own the front end as well, the mobile apps, the web apps, the whole thing, soup to nuts. And what we wanted to do was take our trading system, which we had a proven business and success with, and put it inside a Hong Kong bank. So it wasn't software as a service, actually. We would deliver software to their infrastructure in Hong Kong uh, and deliver a different client experience, trading experience for those clients. So why did we need this to hap happen together? Well, we needed reach. I mean, nobody knew who the hell Oanda was in Hong Kong, right? So there was a very big value to have you know, brand recognition with this bank. Uh, and they needed technology. I mean, what we were really good at, and Oanda, the, you know, the roots of Oanda is very engineering, technology-based. Uh, we just happen to be in the financial industry, but we're, we're very much a technology company, and we do that well. And they knew that looking at what we'd built over, at that time, a 10-year period, uh, they weren't gonna, they weren't going to be able to easily replicate that. So they had reach and customers, and you know, we had a product that they wanted. So in Deploying this, you know, essentially we needed teams from all over the world, and I'm going to try to convince you that that's true. So when I say it was a global project, this is what I mean by it was a global project. So these stars represent you know, areas where activity was happening. So this first red star, uh, that's Hong Kong. Don't look too closely about where the stars are on the map. My geography was not my best subject, but I think it's pretty close. Uh, that was actually where the system was going to be physically located. These two stars, the red and the, the two red stars here are, this is where development was happening. So our development teams, the customer and, and Oanda's development teams were split across these cities. In these locations, this is where testing was happening. I'm not gonna talk a lot about testing tonight, but if, for any of you doing global technology deployments, I do not recommend testing happening in four cities across the world. It is pandemonium. 
And finally, all of these places together was where we had business support, we had uh, legal, admin, other uh, technical architecture happening everywhere. So it really was you know, across all of the parts of the, of the globe. And if you actually look at, you know, they're actually perfectly equidistant, these stars, which guaranteed that there was no good time in the day for everybody to get on the phone together. That, I mean, it made it just physically impossible. And the other thing that made it really challenging was of all the things, if, if you've dealt with remote teams, you've probably had this experience. This was particularly difficult, but uh, if, you, if you've ever dealt with daylight savings time, it's surprisingly one of the most technically difficult things you can handle in a project uh, of this scale is dealing with the daylight savings time because North America has a different one from Europe, has a different one from parts of Asia who don't have it at all. Uh, and once you've finally figured out you know, the one hour of the day where you can all get on the phone and that gets messed up, it, it wreaks havoc in your project. So suffice it to say, it was a global project. Uh, there were about 200 people working on it worldwide. At the time, that was more than the size of Awanda. So they, they greatly outnumbered us too, which was you know, another challenge for us. We were a small technology company and they were a huge, huge bank. Okay, so it was global. Now, a little bit about the technology. I'm not gonna get into the architecture. That's not really the, the point of this, but this box here represents basically our stuff. So that thing that I described to you, the back end, the, the pricing, the database, the, the GUIs, uh, that's, you know, that's the OANDA business in there. It's, it's quite a bit more complicated under the covers, but essentially it's represented there. To give you an idea of the target environment that we needed to put our stuff inside of, that was all of their stuff. So. We had this little box, uh, and they had all of these other boxes. Please do not stare directly into the chart. The, the thing that, that's, you know, again, what the boxes do isn't exactly, isn't actually the important part, but each of these boxes pretty much represents a different subsystem, and even worse, they're, they were probably owned by a different team. <coughs> So it made for a lot of negotiating <laughs> of interfaces, and, and for them, a way more complicated environment than for us. Okay, so of course in any project like this, the thing that makes it challenging is also then the unreasonable timeline that, that is uh, put upon you. So everything has to come together perfectly across the globe with all of these teams, with all of this technology for us to pull it off. So back to diversity, you know, and how was it related to this project? So diversity was definitely adding complexity in this project. That was, you know, understood. But remember, we entered into it because we thought there was going to be great value in the partnership. So it was, there was a, it was a very deliberate choice. That didn't mean we didn't have the problems to solve. So when I'm talking about diversity, I don't just mean um, geography. That's the thing that people most often migrate to. It's, it's obvious when I show a map and some stars all spread out that you know, there's diversity that's related to where you're from, clearly. But in a project like that, the things that you encounter probably more, that are more difficult to actually deal with are less about geography and more about technology and your actual product development. So from a technology perspective, you know, as a company grows up, you know, Awanda, as a internet startup kind of feeling company, was making certain technology choices that a large bank of 200,000 people had completely different constraints and technology stacks that would go with it. And the two had to somehow meet in the middle. Same with the product development. I mean, you know, our product development process was very, very quick, very agile. You know, Bob made a change. You'd just have to tell Mary, who's sitting like three feet away, and, and you know, that was the process, right? Uh, but if, you know, in, if you're dealing and transacting with lots of money across the globe and very he heavily regulated, uh, you know, you have a different set of concerns. So it's not right or wrong, it's just different. And what we definitely discovered is, you know, your, your only hope of getting past these things is to understand as much as possible as you can about the other person, the other group's point of view. That is actually the thing that helps you at the end of the day the most, right? Being open-minded. So all these different kinds of diversity usually, you know, then manifest themselves as something we call, you know, cultural differences. So cultural differences is some combination of all of these things. So what I want to take you through is what we did about the, the, the different areas. All right, so geography. So, Yes, remember this, this was our geography problem, right? Uh, and quite obviously, uh, you know, different languages, customs, the time zones, that was a, a challenge. If you've dealt with remote teams, you've probably dealt with this already. Uh, a quick note on languages, if you are, if you have, if you have English as your first language, that's a very lucky thing, because when you go out into the world, 
most people actually conduct business still in English, and they've learned English as a second language. Uh, so if you are a native English speaker, you have a, already a tremendous advantage. And you're going to find yourself on the phone or in a meeting someday with somebody who's using English as a second language. Uh, and what I would see on conference calls all the time is there was some lack of understanding and a language barrier that was occurring. And, and people would just start raising their voices. So just a small word of advice, yelling doesn't actually help understanding. You actually have to speak slower, not louder. And you know, we get into this, why is everybody yelling in this room? It's like, they don't understand me. It's like, yeah, they don't, it's not the volume, they're not deaf, right? So <laughs> no need to yell, that's all I'm saying. Uh, so the, these, were, these were areas of um, uh, opportunity as well as challenge, right? And that's why I put that up there, actually. Because you could absolutely view this as a hurdle to overcome uh, over the course of a deployment. But it's really cool, actually, to, to meet people from other places and to know what they're about uh, and to actually have those experiences. So from my perspective, it's a tremendous opportunity as well, personally, and I think for the company as well. So that was geography. So what, what do we actually do about this? Well, this is where all the old tricks, like there's nothing fancy or new here. Uh, we went there. Uh, that, that's really important. And because we have so much technology now that allows collaboration remotely, this gets lost a little bit. Uh, we have video conferencing, we, you know, you know, much better voice quality, that can be done cheaply and very well. But what you don't get from that, you get the meeting, um, but you don't get any other kind of contact out of there. And the other thing is with people trying to cut back on expenses, the travel budget goes very quickly uh, you know, in a company, and, and rightly so, because very often that becomes a very ballooned up expenditure. But if you never go there, you can't do my second thing, which is share some meals together. Uh, the formal comes from the informal. And what we found, you know, so the humans have been doing this for thousands of years, like hunter-gatherer societies from thousands of years ago. Like this is, this is a, a communal meal is a concept that extends outside of family and has a social construct that's actually in the community. And what the, you know, what the hunters would all do is they'd bring their, you know, spoils of war to the, to the center of the town and they would share them, right? It was a way of celebrating that cooperation. Uh, and it's not so different in a technology project. I mean, you know, you're not putting you know, deer heads on the table, but you're, you're actually you know, talking about things that aren't just about work, and that's the key. On a business trip, the thing that gets the attention is the agenda, I need to talk to those developers, we need this whiteboard session, you know, that manager has to you know, get my presentation on the such and such, uh, but the thing that's left off is what you're doing outside of the hours informally, and that's probably the most important reason, and the most important thing that you can do when you're there, to get them outside of the office. And for God's sakes, try not to talk about work the whole time, too. That's the actual value of it as well. So just a couple of examples of that. This, in this case, uh, I had quite a bit of travel to Hong Kong. The other thing I will travel, I'll say about travel and expenses is it's a bit of a false economy to say you're saving money by not traveling if by not traveling you actually reduce efficiency and, and aren't able to create relationships in the project that you need to deploy the thing, right? So that doesn't mean travel all the time, but try to find some balance. So in sharing meals over many different types of dim sum in, in Hong Kong that, that I had the, uh, the great pleasure of experiencing, uh, I learned two things. I learned actually my counterpart um, in this project was an ex-officer in the British military, uh, and his job was actually to defuse bombs. So, you know, what, what, why is that useful, right? I mean, it's not, we weren't diffusing bombs, we were building trading systems. But what I knew immediately from that is that whatever the heck was gonna go wrong in this project, I mean, this guy, there was nothing that could, you know, he was unflappable, right? Like, there was just no crisis that was worse than, you know, life and death and, you know, a bomb going off, right? So I was like, okay, well, you know, Nick, that's good. <laughs> He's gonna have a level head, good to know, right? And the other thing I actually came out through, through one of these meals as well was, one of the, the testing centers in mainland China, uh, unbeknownst to us, uh, apparently after lunch every day in this particular location, uh, they would take pillows out from under their desk, uh, put them on the desk, lights would go off, everybody would put their heads down, and there would be a 20-minute nap. Everybody, quiet, 20 minutes nap, right? And we were scheduling conference calls during that time, and they were really very polite, right? So nobody said anything about it. And, and then, like, you know, if you're, if you're expecting to have a nap after lunch, right, and somebody schedules a conference call to talk about some bug they found, like, you know, you're, you're kind of annoyed when you start that call, right? So, <laughs> having learned this, we were like, well, we can just make the call, like, 20 minutes later, right? Like, it doesn't, you know, why didn't you just say something, right? But, as I said, they were very, quite polite about it. 
we well, moved the conference call and this calls went so much better. It was, it was just you know, a, a complete accident that we learned that we were taking up their nap time, basically, right? <laughs> so I, I, you know, <laughs> my premise is that we would not have figured that out uh, you know, on, on conference calls and through email. Also, a lot of great meals you get out of it, too, so <laughs> if you're a foodie. All right, so we went there and we shared some meals together. Some oldest tricks work the best. Uh, technology, so yes, remember this? This was our challenge. Um, and in case it's not obvious, in the time frame that we had, we had about a six month period, it was going to be impossible to learn about all of the technology stacks going on inside the bank. Like, there was just no way that was going to happen, right? Um, and the other thing that we learned pretty quickly, uh, and this is the difference of going from a, a company that has their own product and is just delivering it for themselves and for their own customers to actually providing that product to somebody else to run for themselves. So we were used to, like I said, Bob makes a change. You know, hey Mary, I made this change, and you know, Mary, okay, got it, Bob, and you know, ch and you know, the next day it's out in production, right? Then that's the process, right? Uh, but you can see here, and you can have an appreciation for, we needed to understand that all those other things going on on some level, because very small interface changes would really muck it up, right? Uh, and it could, you know, now when you have to think about the 10 teams that have impacts and all the, you know, apologies that have to happen, <laughs> and the relationship management that has to go with that, uh, and the distrust in the relationship, I mean, you, you really had to understand the impact of that. And the other thing was even small semantic changes to the business logic. So even if you were holding those interfaces like, absolutely sacrosanct, you were making some, you know, change to the business logic that, you know, there are some assumptions somewhere down over there, uh, and then it would go badly and just as bad, right? And we, weren't, we just weren't used to that, you know, we just weren't used to running that way, right? The person who needed to know was in the same room as you all the time. Right? So this was definitely a challenge. So uh, what did we do about this? Well, this doesn't sound very collaborative, but actually, you got to wall off your stuff. Like, you, you really, this helps you communicate. It doesn't, you know, it sounds like it doesn't, but it actually does. So what we did in, in particular was we, you have to be, it's hard to pick what these walls are when you have that crazy mess that I was just showing to you earlier. Uh, but it can be done, and you should absolutely spend time on this up front. And we were trying to be as mercenary as possible about those, you know, the walls that we chose. But, you know, the walls get invaded and a little bit bruised every once in a while. Uh, but, you know, it's not 100% perfect every time. You have to make sometimes some compromises. But I don't recommend it as much as possible. If you can make, you know, if you can wall off your stuff and, you know, self-contain, you know, your bit, it goes way, way better, right? Instead of trying to figure out the you know, 20 different points, points of ingress, uh, and ultimately what that means is from a maintainability perspective, if you actually have to now change any part of the features, you have like a thousand things to change as opposed to one. So what this helped us do, then even from a, just a communication uh, perspective in the projects, I mean, we know that we had to go to the different towers to talk, like that's where you're talking, right? We're not talking all the way along the wall, right? We're just like right at the tower, like, very, very, uh, very much easier to do. And the other thing we did was we built the interfaces first. So, you know, in any kind of project like that, there's a bunch of features they want you to build. There's, you know, and those are a little bit easier to get your hands around. You kind of understand them. Uh, the interface stuff, nobody really wants to, you know, it's not really the fun stuff, but I absolutely, you should build the interfaces first. You're not going to get it right the first time, and you need time to actually iterate through those uh, through the interfaces and the, like what you actually want that functionality to be. So that's what we did for the technology side. All right, so product development. This actually, of all of the things, was the most difficult. So my message here is you, you will not be assimilated if you're, it's a little bit dark, but um, the point of diversity is actually not to assimilate, it's actually to retain the uniqueness and the, the advantages that you have, right? What were the challenges here? Well, quite obviously, they were a large institution, and we were not. Right? So we just did things very differently, and, and really how it manifested itself in a, in a product development life cycle was around waterfall versus agile. I mean, that's, that's really, they were much more waterfall. And I said, it's not right or wrong. Like, I, I, I run engineering. My preference is agile. That's what happens at, you know, Oanda. But, you know, I can understand like, why, you know, waterfall has a place in an organization like that when you have so many checks and balances that you have to go through and contracts need to be signed and, you know, th those kinds of things actually, you know, mandate in some cases a waterfall approach. You know, it's kind of bad to say that, but it's true, <laughs> you know. 
So this is our, these, these were the most difficult to get over. Okay. Now, because we're, you know, they were a very big customer, uh, obviously it mandated some way to work together, like we, we couldn't just do it our way. So this is kind of roughly what we did. This is a very grossly simplified version of what we did, but the blue boxes on the top of the bottom are really them, right, and, and really waterfall, I would say. And the green middle is, is Wanda. So up front, you know, what we did with them was we negotiated requirements and the interface. It was very formal, you know, the documents had, you know, version numbers and they looked all official and those are things that go into contracts. Uh, it's still not the thing that you end up with at the end, but nonetheless, you know, that's, that's what we started with. It doesn't, doesn't actually mean that's what you build, but we started up there, makes everybody comfortable, it's a good way to start the project, right, you're building trust. Um, so then what, what we quickly realized is one of the reasons, and you know, one of the reasons they were attracted to Awanda at all was our technology teams, like they had come to Toronto, they'd, they'd visited the development groups, they like, really liked the culture, they saw that we could deliver product quickly in a way that they couldn't do, right? so they wanted to leverage that. And what we didn't want to do was go into waterfall mode, you know, because that was actually the thing, you know, the thing that we were good at was delivering products. So you don't want to change that, right? So we wanted to, you know, this is where the walling off your stuff becomes important because we wanted to create our own little, let's make sure our product development process can remain untouched for the most part. So we ran our sprints and we would deploy to an internal sandbox and every day or two you'd actually have features coming in the internal sandbox, which is usually what we would do. Uh, and, and it was agile, it was informal, it was our rules, you know, that was, that was our, our playground. And then later on when it had to go out to, you know, client infrastructure land, you know, then you put release notes and documents and we would agree with them, you know, how many sprints we wanted to go before actually, you know, packaging a release to send them. Um, but they wouldn't, they, they just couldn't keep up with the software that we were delivering, like their, their process actually couldn't handle a release every day or a release every week or every two weeks even. So, you actually had to say, all right, every four weeks, if that's, that's the pace of the organization, you had to kind of fit that. But what we didn't want to do was slow everything down. So that's, that's one thing we did. The thing that actually really helped us that we did, and I'm not sure if you'd be able to do this on your projects, but I would recommend it, and I would do that for future projects myself, was we opened up our internal sandbox to them. So it wasn't a free-for-all. The APIs that we negotiated, the interfaces, those were the, that was the access we gave them, but we, we knew that, you know, in order to actually really be agile, we needed them to be interacting with our product very early on because they would give us feedback. Now, the trick with that is, as soon as you open it up, what's good about it is it's really transparent, right? I mean, they were seeing the thing pretty much when other developers, I mean, sometimes I didn't see it, like they saw it first, right? So that was actually really good for transparency and building trust. Hey, we're producing things. It's not like we go into some black hole for four, month, four weeks and then you hope something comes out at the end, like you can see progress. The challenge was it is expectation managing because now what they want is, a, I need the thing to be up, I want this feature, and they have all, all kinds of requests and demands. So you actually help, need to help manage those expectations and, and for it to work, you, you really have to be the one that owns it. Say, no, 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 this is a you know, best effort. You know, we really want you to take part in this, but uh, we're gonna do it our way, right? And what we found was that those poor developers on the other side, I mean, they're taking downstream from a trading system to build a test harness or something that simulates an entire trading system. I mean, you know, there was no way they were gonna get that done. So what we were offering them was, hey, here's a real live functioning trading system that you can use. So they were all over it. Uh, and in the end, I think their testing was, you know, the reason <laughs> they did way more testing than we did, first of all, and they actually did a lot of our testing for us. Uh, and certainly in working out the interfaces and getting the right feature in those iterations and their feedback immediately, it was great. And because it was our environment, we could sort of take or leave the feedback as, as we chose. But um, very, very important to the success of this project in accelerating the pace. Right? So we kind of brought them into Agile land uh, along with us. So. All right, so wh what do we did? Well, this, the most important thing is actually that we, we kept us what we kept what made us successful. Like your, your, your uniqueness is the advantage that you bring to the table. So my advice to you is understand what that unique and successful quality is about yourself and keep that part, right? There's gonna be other parts that are non-core that you actually have to you know, come halfway or do some compromise or maybe even go the other way altogether. But the thing that you're good at, be good at that thing. You know, that's, that's a real advantage for you, you should keep it. Uh, the other thing that we did was we were very transparent and 
you know, but in that transparent, as, transparency, as I mentioned, you know, truth needs context. Uh, and, and if you don't explain the thing that you just like land on the doorstep, the, all kinds of other assumptions come in. So you really need people to manage uh, the expectations. So these sacrificial lambs, if there's any project managers in the room, I'm sorry, that might be you. But uh, it's very important to, you know, you know, and for us it was very important to be able to preserve, you know, and make fast the product development process. So you, you just need some, some guards, basically. You, know. you could pay somebody to do that. <laughs> All right, so, so in the end, um, in the end we hit the, day, the date, you know, and we actually delivered what we said we would deliver. Uh, and probably more importantly, actually, this, this is one of those projects where you have to work for people all over the world. Really cool travel, um, really interesting people, people who I would still call my friends, actually. You know, when you go through the wars together, that, that tends to be what happens. So, you know, it could not have happened, you know, without the help and the cooperation and the expertise of the customer. And it would have been very easy for us at the beginning to say as an internet technology kind of cool, fun startup to say, oh, you know, it's just them, it's a bank, it's huge, they don't know what they're talking about, we know technology. And to start with that kind of us versus them attitude, very quickly it can go down that path. Uh, and I think everybody had the real, like a really good attitude about it to see what the value was of their technology teams and, and the bank itself. I mean, it doesn't mean I want to go work at a bank, but, you know, couldn't have done it without them. So it was, from that perspective, very, very uh, important. Okay, so back to this thing. Uh, at the beginning, I was talking about you know how American insects destroyed uh, French vines and how we got better wine because of it, right? So, we just bring that back around. All right, so it was a piece of technology that actually made this contact inevitable. And in my example, I'm going to say way more broadly that the internet makes contact inevitable outside of your sphere. Like it is, it is going to for sure happen to you. Like that is, if you are a software developer or a project manager or anywhere near a, a company that's delivering a technology product, you will absolutely, you know, have to deal with uh, diversity. Right? And probably you already have a client or a partner, a product that's, that's global. Uh, I also said that it was an inability to handle diversity that created a threat. Uh, and in the example that I showed, this ability was actually, the ability to handle diversity was actually the opportunity. And that's actually what I would like to, you know, for, for it to resonate with you more that it's an opportunity than a threat. It's actually a way to scale and grow if you use it the right way. I mean, you, you can't just, you know, you can't always just do it alone. And in particular in the life of a, a company, uh, and Awanda is an example of that. You know, when we started, when I started Awanda, there were 10 people, very, very small. And we were, we were very insular and we could do everything ourselves, right? But as you grow and you're, you know, the, your goals change, you start to realize this thing that you have can be successful, it gets bigger and bigger, and you need other people <laughs> to, help you, to help you achieve the goals that you want to have, right? So it's not just a defensive strategy, it's actually an offensive strategy. I, I mentioned that the American and French plants were the solution to our last problem, and in mine it was really from four continents, it was Technology from everywhere was actually the actual solution and remembering that it wasn't about assimilating everything and blending it all together. It was actually, you know, maintaining the unique pieces that created the diversity that made it successful, right? Uh, and finally, you know, we got some better wine out of the, the first example. So I don't know if we got better wine out of the first example. This is maybe a little less compelling. <laughs> but uh, for, the, for the Hong Kong traders, uh, you know, they actually did get a better uh, trading experience. So we, we actually did deliver on that and on time and on budget, which is uh, also a nice thing. So it worked out well in the end. So if there's a, a moral to this whole story, you know, bringing it back to the beginning, you know, diversity absolutely will add complexity. Right? It is not an easy thing to deal with. But it's also the thing that creates, you know, a huge amount of value. You know, for, not just in your business, right? I mean, your career, absolutely. Like I've traveled all over the world, and you know, in the name of technology, and that is, I could tell you, 100% helped my career. In particular, if you're in charge of technology for, you know, an internet business, but also just for yourself. I mean, there's some pretty interesting trips that you can have along the way. So if you are, you know, if you're hiring or you're looking for teammates, you know, bring people into your lives that are from different walks of life, or at the very least who are open-minded. Is, that is exactly the kind of person that you want to work with will help you grow. Uh, and finally, I would just say for yourselves to be curious. I mean, being curious is actually the thing that helps you understand your, you know, the other guy's point of view. 
ultimately it will, will lead to your success and, and come in handy. The thing is when you're curious about, about a thing, it, there's not an immediate payoff to that, right? You don't know when it's gonna come in handy and why you're gonna need it and when. Um, but I guarantee you someday it will actually, that broad knowledge is, is something that's extremely valuable in our industry, irrespective of what we're applying the technology to. All right, thanks everybody. Uh, <laughs> Questions? Yes. Uh, you talked about the project itself and, and the data experience, but after the project, did you find that change awareness apart from just going bigger to do services as well? Um, that's a good question. Did it change Oanda? Yes, actually. I mean, the thing that it changes, I mean, it didn't really change, actually. Some of the things about our product development process, they actually had some good practices that we could kind of steal. That was a good thing. Um, it, it sort of opens your eyes, right? I mean, you're, you're in a box, uh, and then you're, you're outside of the box. So all of a sudden, uh, when you have customers from, you know, in particular from Asia, a very different model from you know, North American clients, uh, the way they interact with it and the use of it was actually very, very interesting for us. And for Oanda, we also want to get bigger in, in Asia as well. So that was a, sort of like, oh my God, look, look, at all the, look at this market out here. People really want to trade and we should be out here. So it, it sort of uh, opened, those, opened our eyes. Like we were already making forays into it, but it didn't have the same importance until we actually saw that it could be successful. was the biggest crisis? Um, the biggest crisis was actually, it's also cultural, so there are a lot of security requirements uh, inside a, a large king institution, as you might imagine. And um, I guess they weren't involved up front, and I, I understand that the people inside the bank actually really didn't like these guys, like they were, they were like, you know, the SS over there. Like, it, they, nobody wanted to talk to them. They were all fearful of them. It was like, well, who are those guys? Why is everybody so afraid of them? Uh, anyway, so they, uh, you know, had to approve this thing. Um, they weren't really strong on the technology side, and they didn't know our technology stack. So we came to a point where they were a really big roadblock, and it became even more complicated because they were directly going to the regulator and uh, causing a danger to actually be allowed to go live from the local regulator. So ha, that was uh, excruciating. There's some of it where you just have to, I'm gonna teach you about technology today. Like that was a little bit, right? Cause it was, you know, it just not the smartest people end up in that <laughs> part of the bank apparently. Uh, and we were, it was so different from the other people that we met. But a lot of what that was, was really, then you go back to the guy who diffused the bombs. <laughs> he was most helpful in this situation or, you know, you, you kind of play chicken with the business and say, well, are you, are you gonna let them say no? If you say no, we're, this thing isn't gonna go out on time. And then it becomes a who's gonna blink first uh, kind of game. So the, at the, the unfortunate thing was it happened late enough in the project that we had by then very, very strong ties and trust with the, the, the project teams inside the bank. So they were completely on our side. Uh, and together, that was a, a pretty formidable um, opponent to say both the vendor and you know the, the internal customer weren't gonna, weren't gonna do it but it was a very 11th hour we're going to say no you can't do this thing and it was uh, what? Who, what who are you what no uh, you know so that was that was scary it wasn't actually the technology part it was just these you know random guy thrown in saying I can say no to everything you know and he probably could have it was just the business overrode him in the end Uh, well, I think the, the advantage of actually of uh, being in Toronto is that you, it's almost built in. You know, I mean, just people are from all over the place in, you know, in this city. Uh, I would like more women <laughs> on the team. I, <laughs> but uh, there, are, there are many women to be found in, uh, in engineering. That, that's my, uh, my one uh, hope that we could increase that. Uh, but I would say definitely in, you know, inside our company, it's pretty, pretty global. We also, because we have to actually manage um, remote operations, it's very, like very few of our clients are actually Canadian. Uh, so we need, you know, language speakers for other parts of the world. So it sort of brings that, that culture into the company. But I would say within the engineering team, that's something I'm actually pretty proud of. I think it's, it's quite diverse, like I said, so other than I'd like more, like more girls around. But, but how do you derive value from the actual 
because our customers are from all over the place. So the people building the product actually, you know, have a perspective about other parts of the world. I think ultimately that's what helps you. In projects like this, I mean, sometimes actually, oh, you speak Japanese, great, you know. I mean, th that's very, very direct and, and obvious. But other than that, it's just a just bringing people from different points of view. That actually represents our customer base. And if, you're, if your engineering teams can actually be, you know, have that point of view, like different points of view that isn't just North American, uh, that's very, very uh, useful. It's intrinsic, right? right. Exactly. We didn't have UTF-8 support, that was a problem. But um, <laughs> uh, plan to have other languages in you know, the front end parts of your, your product, I, I would say that. Uh, what's another thing that we, we would have done differently? Hmm. I'm not sure, I think most of it is the, you need um, early on a perspective around what other parts of the world are doing and that's that's more of a hiring thing like you actually have to bring those people in yeah like I was wondering like so we have internally in the, in the product side we have globalization managers yeah we obviously clearly focus on you know thinking about how people outside of North America are going to look at our products yeah. do you now have that goal within OAN and do you think it would have benefited to have that goal early on oh Absolutely. Well, what we did eventually, um, we tried to do that ourselves in Toronto, and eventually we were like, you know, we don't understand Japan in Toronto. We don't. Right? Um, we should get some people in Japan to help us answer this question. Eventually, that's where we, when we had enough dollars to do this, uh, what we really needed was, you know, we, if to, to be global, sometimes you need to be local, right? You, and, and actually, what we had to do was, at first, we said, it's just going to be for everybody. Uh, and, and you, you say we're, we're, we want to be bigger in Asia, right? Well, you know that's an enormous like. There's so many differences between the countries there. So the other thing that would have been helpful is a bit more focus, I would say, on the countries that where we actually wanted to target, because then you're, you know, otherwise your localization manager is like, I got 160 languages. It's like, well, you know, that can be a real, you know, nightmare on its own, and you know, you can't have any focus or target around that. So ultimately, what made us much more successful is when we picked countries. It's like we want. We want London, we want Singapore, we want Tokyo. Like we, we went into to markets that, where we could actually grow and focus. And it doesn't mean the rest of the world you know, aren't our customers, but it was just more focused, right? Because it's just such a huge problem to solve, right? Yeah, and I said, well, you know, I'll, I'll tell you what, what we did and actually worked quite well for us. I mean, just start with the thing that you're good at, right? I mean, if you create a lot of distraction, like, up front, that, that becomes more of a challenge. Unless your business plan is, you know, we were only going to sell things in China, then, I mean, obviously, you have to go after China. But I would actually, you know, introducing language and localiz localizing your, your product is, is something that I, I actually wouldn't start with that. I would just build the thing, get it to work, get some customers, get that feedback happening right away. Uh, and then worry about you know how do you make it more global, right? Just you know test and learn a little bit, right? Because if you if you try to if you try to do that all at once, it would be you know it would probably be a, a lot right out of the gates, unless you had like somehow on your team that a really strong expertise for that, which most people don't, right? Most most of these startups start with you know usually a bunch of technologists, right? <laughs> Maybe a couple of business people with a good idea. So I would just if you're starting up, build the thing. That's your number one priority. Or go ahead, do you have a follow-up? <laughs> um, That's funny, we're debating this on the way here. Uh, we don't, I would say. We're just about to do that. So right now we have that distributed. Actually, uh, one of my jobs at Oanda was opening up um, uh, 
all of our offices, so getting regulated there, actually getting the product ready to be deployed in those regions. Uh, and when you're a small company, you kind of wear like a lot of hats to start. And what we did was, um, so I would become the expert on like, you know, I know a lot about regulations in Singapore for, you know, for some reason. And now what we're coming to is, you know, because our product is so much more diverse, we have project managers that might deal with, from a tactical perspective, the, the directors in, in the different regions, so that helps to coordinate. But they're not really driving what the product needs to be out there. And we're definitely starting to realize, like, what we want to sell in Australia versus Japan, I mean, the two are not the same, and they cut across all your products. So there is, so now, actually, what we're starting to introduce is exactly that, like, have a product manager who is based on geography, especially if you want to penetrate certain geographies and build expertise there. Uh, that's exactly what we're going about to do. Yeah, so I mean, I think, um, I mean, there was just no good time. It was some, always somebody's morning and somebody's day. Uh, the thing that to improve the communication is you want to share that that burden, right? To, so sometimes it's your morning, sometimes it's their, you know, uh, their morning. So that was one thing. Be fair about when those calls are happening because sometimes they're just going to happen at, you know, lousy times for everybody. That was so. Then there was a bit of that. Um, the other thing we do is we try to isolate the pain to, <laughs> to some individuals, right? So, you know, we're not bringing a whole development team on calls. Uh, and, and that means that somebody takes the pain, right? But it's just kind of isolated. So one, of the, one of those people's in the room right now, so he's like <laughs> shaking in his chair. But <laughs> yeah, th that actually helped too. The other thing that it helped do was if you, you want uh, at least to start the same voices all the time. Uh, otherwise, it gets very inconsistent very quickly. Uh, and you want to want to have one message. And when you're a small company, I mean, we would be in, you know, when I would go to Hong Kong, like, I'd, it'd be, literally, I'd be in meetings by myself with 30 other people, right? Like, there was just three deep. In the, and it's just very weird and intimidating at first. But actually, from our perspective, that means single point of contact just going to go through this way. So, you know, the single point of contact meant that we could deal with the time zone. You know, we could isolate it to just a few individuals who, you know, we're really putting out for, for this project. Uh, and it also created, you know, a much more efficient communication. The, the problem was, eventually, it becomes a bottleneck. I mean, absolutely, when the thing scales. And, and that was difficult. At first, it, you know, it had to get pretty bad before we, you know, loosen, loosened up uh, a little bit. But eventually, we did. And then it's like, OK, we'll pick two or three people and figure out what their specific deliverables on the projects are that we want to have communication over and we just started to manage it that way but you couldn't do that up front because you didn't know what the hell the things were going to be and and so like i said somebody takes the pain How did we scale the, well, I don't think it was a conscious decision, actually. Uh, you know, we realized that we needed different languages, and we tried to absorb it in our development teams. Uh, and we didn't really have, that was another thing, actually, building into your product a good way to, you know, get translations in. Like, we hadn't really done that. So what we, you know, what we learned over time was the thing that we needed to scale was we needed, we needed tools so that we could replace text or, you know, different characters in the front end interfaces and ship it off to you know, some translator or product manager, whoever was going to manage the business side of it, and then have them be able to easily put it back in. And the, the mistake that we have, uh, that was actually going on in this project. We had developers helping manage that process, which is a huge waste of time. So the, the real answer and the way, the way we actually eventually, I don't think we're even fully there yet, um, was to just build it into your product away. So almost like saying you have a content management system for a website. You know, you don't want developers actually, you know, making code changes to just change content. Uh, and you have to have the same kind of idea in, in your product to, so that you can actually do localization and have it be outside of the development team and you know, firmly in the hands of the business who actually know what the words should be and can make changes quickly on the fly. Because because there's so many like the, it becomes so um, subjective 
you know, because some customer or somebody will say, oh, that's not how you say that in, you know, German, and, and then somebody will say, I would have said it like this, and, you know, you know, from my perspective at that point, I'm like, I don't care how you want to say it, just you change it over there, and, and when, you, when you're happy and you've fought that out, then we'll, then we'll make the change, so try to build it in. Uh, they found us. It happened to us. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Cheers, thanks. <laughs>